guys, how's it going, Laura with Garden Answer? It's time for our midsummer garden tour. There's a lot of things I wanna show you. In fact, you can probably see all the beautiful color right behind me. There's a lot of other things I wanna show you too. And um, there's some areas where we're clearing stuff out, getting ready for new projects. Um, also, a lot of perennials need some attention. It's getting to be that time of year when they've already flushed out and done their first, you know, first summer bloom. We need to cut them back so that they can gather energy and bloom again. So I've worked on some of the beds, but there are still quite a number of perennials I need to cut back. So I'll show you what I've got going on. Uh, we wanted to start right in the front of the house because of how beautiful it looks, how full of color it is. We did not do a video when I planted this stuff and I'm really sad that we didn't now. Um, it was just that I didn't think I had enough plants uh, in the beginning. Now I know I had the perfect amount of plants. Um, I also didn't know if they were going to be compatible. I didn't really know how it was going to look. Usually I can have a vision of how something's going to end up, but you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience with this meteor shower verbena. Now I want it everywhere. It's just so beautiful. Now the thing about this area is that it gets water with our grass sprinklers and it gets a lot of water. So we've done super tunias in the past. Of course, super tunia bubble gum, we did the first year we were in this house. It did awesome because super, super tunia bubble gum will do pretty much whatever you throw at it, it'll take and it'll look beautiful no matter what. Um, we did Super Tunia Bordeaux here last year. It got a little bit too much water, I think, for that variety. Um, so this year I tried Super Tunia Hot Pink Charm, which I've tried three of the charm varieties of Super Tunia this year and I am totally sold because they're a little bit more compact and they give you kind of a Super Bells look while still being a Super Tunia, which are a little bit easier to take care of. Um, we've got the uh, Sweet Caroline Bewitched Light Green, which is an amazing potato vine. And I wanted to plant this one kind of as like an understory plant for the verbena to kind of trail and fill in you know, underneath it so that these could look like they were kind of floating. Uh, and it's really starting to take on that appearance. I just, I think it looks so pretty and I think it works water wise because while the verbena and supertunia don't need as much water as the potato vine, I think because this area um, I don't know, because I planted the potato vine, these are happy because I think the potato vine is utilizing all that extra water, if that makes sense. So I think it's a really compatible blend. Um, I did notice on this side, it actually gets a little bit more water than the other side and the verbena is yellowing a tiny little bit. Um, so we're gonna see if we can't adjust things a little bit. And that's what it's about. You know, we experiment with stuff, see how it works. We adjust water all the time. In fact, I'll be showing you some of the big water projects we've been working on this year, and that was one of our priorities this year. Um, right up here, Super Tunia Bordeaux, looking beautiful. Um, and the limelights we planted last year are just fantastic. So last year, I don't know if you remember when I planted them, but I think, I'm gonna show you where the old growth was. They were only about this tall. I think they've doubled uh, since we planted them. And of course they've filled in and they're full of blooms. And when we planted them last year, it was kind of late in the season. And I had an umbrella right here to shade them because <laughs> it gets quite a bit of sun right here. And they were just, we planted them when it was hot and it was getting so much sun and the poor things were struggling a little bit. And so I put an umbrella up and they have clearly adjusted to their space and they're doing really well. So I'm really thrilled with how they look. Um, of course, we mirrored it on this side. I've got Super Tunia Bordeaux and a few Super Tunia Priscilla mixed in here. Um, Priscilla has kind of the same look as Bordeaux, but it's a double. I love this Super Tunia. I ran out of Bordeaux. That's why I had to throw some Priscilla in here. Um, and then I've talked about this privet hedge here, uh, which does need to be shorn a little bit, but it's too hot right now. If I, you know, kind of came in here with some hedge trimmers and exposed any undergrowth, it would probably burn. We have an overcast day, which is super rare um, this time of year. So we Thought it would be a great time to show you guys around the garden but not so great time to hedge so this is going to look a little fluffy until it gets a little cooler out later in the summer it is hiding an ac unit that's why it's here um, many people many of you guys have asked about why we have this massive chunk of a privet hedge right here and that's why it is hiding something that's worse to look at so um, right here in the center of the yard i have not done really anything uh, we do have the Hebe fountain, which is not running. I just can't get her to run properly. Um, so I need to do some troubleshooting on her. I still love the way she looks. I would like to her just to be a planter right here, really. Like if I could never get her to run proper, I'd just change her into planter. Um, I do need to come in. I'm gonna be removing, this is a spiderwort or tradescantia, which is everywhere in our garden. It's a fine plant, but it just wants to take over. So I wanna do something really pretty in front of the Hebe here. So this area is definitely just kind of 
to me right now, it looks a little bit mangy. There's not a whole lot of order. Um, and I do see a new gopher mound just right now. Excellent. I don't know why, but the gophers love this little circle area under here, which totally bums me out. So I see new gopher mounds all the time. In fact, I planted some Ansonias last year on the other side and two of them just got barreled through by a gopher. Um, okay, one other pot I wanted to show you up here and some beautiful perennials. So right on this arbor, I planted some Lady Gardener David Austin roses to climb up. There were some honeysuckles that uh, I had been kind of watching and fertilizing the last two years that were already planted here, but they just sat there. They didn't do anything. And I don't know what variety they were, if they just didn't like this spot, but I just thought, you know what, I like David Austin's more. So out the honeysuckles came and those were planted. They did bloom. I need to come in and do some deadheading, but they're doing great. This right here is Supertunia Mulberry Charm. Now, see, this is another one of the charms that I am trying this year, and I'm just totally sold. Look at that. You guys, I've done nothing but fertilize. I've fertilized it once a week. They have drip system that's run to them, so they get watered consistently. Uh, but that's it. No deadheading, nothing. And look at how that looks. That's amazing. I love it. And you can probably see all the hollyhocks here. These were here when we moved in, and I love them. They get just eaten to death, I think, by earwigs. Um, and usually I'm a little bit more liberal with my bait, but I haven't kept up on it up in this area up here. But I just think that they're so cottagey and beautiful looking. I think we'll always have hollyhocks up here. Uh, we did tuck in a few Supertunia bubblegum. Um, I had just a handful of them left after a project and I thought, oh, it'd be just perfect to pop. Actually, I didn't think that, Aaron thought that. He told me that I should do that and I thought it was a good idea. We have a little bit of flower bed that comes out um, past the fence, kind of random. So we popped them in there, ran some drip tube to them, and they're doing excellent. Um, the west side of the garden, while we're up here anyway, uh, the trees are doing really good that we planted. I went ahead and planted some vertigo penicetum and supertunia bubblegum in that little cutout where the elm tree was that we had removed. Um, but like you guys know, I've told you before, we are gonna put a pathway in and it'll start about here. And I don't know, I kind of want to have like some brick columns or something really beautiful with some urns or light posts or something really pretty because this is the driveway, like straight this way. So you have something really pretty to designate the start of a walkway and it'll take off and it'll kind of undulate through the grass path over here to the vegetable garden. So in the meantime, because we have so many other projects going on, I haven't been able to really focus as much on this side because all the grass is going to eventually go and it's going to have pathway with landscaping on both sides. I had some extra space, so I popped some squash plants in down there. There's four different squash plants. There's three more tomatoes right there. In that little cutout, I've got two Cinderella pumpkins, because why not? You have empty space that you don't really have plans to do anything with. You may as well fill it with something that's gonna produce something. So I'm actually kind of excited about it. I love to see that in other people's gardens when I go and I see like herbs or cabbage or something random tucked into a flower bed. It just makes it so much more like magical feeling. Okay, and there's one of the Kinsley Ghost Honeysuckle. This is not the one we showed in the video. This one's a little bit younger. But we don't often show these in tours because they're on the outside of the fence and we don't often walk out this way. You can see the backside of the hay racks, but you guys, we are gonna put out a video that's just solely dedicated to the, excuse me, to those hay racks because I wanted to talk more in detail about everything that we've done with them this season. And I, I don't know, I just wanted to give you more details. So let's head up this direction toward Versailles. I have a beautiful hydrangea to show you over here in the corner. So right here I planted three quick fire hydrangeas last year, which in hindsight I planted them way too close together, but um, one of them's doing fantastic. And I just wanted to show you that this happens sometimes. You plant three of the exact same thing and one of them will look glorious and the other two it's like, hello, where are your buds? There are no blooms. Like what in the world? Like they get the same exact light, the same exact water. These look like they are either, they need some iron maybe. There's one bloom. It's trying. So, you know, this one doesn't really have the yellowing of the leaves. So I don't know if maybe those just need a little bit of extra amending. Um, but isn't this glorious? I think it's just so beautiful. I'm so excited to see it grow. And you know, I'll probably amend the soil around these with some iron tone. Um, just leave them alone for a little while. They'll probably kick into gear. And that just happens sometimes. You just have something random. If they continue to not like this spot for some reason, I'll dig them up and move them. 
because these will get, they get really good size. So this one will actually fill in pretty much this whole area just by itself. But anyway, I wanted to show that to you because I was thinking that it might be an encouragement to you to see what happens sometimes. You know, there's sometimes there's just no explanation and you just, you know, whatever, it's gardening. Okay, so I don't know if you can see really well that big grass by the privet hedge. I forgot to show you up close but it looks so pretty. It's called a Miscanthus Cabaret, and it was something I had in our old garden, and I'm so glad that they had one here. It's such a statement grass. I um, mean, it just comes back beautifully every year, so I wanted to make sure to show you that because it looks just, the shape of it's perfect. Okay, so here in Versailles, um, the Supertunias we chose this year, I think are doing really well. We've got Supertunia Latte in two corners, and that's obviously the one that's loving the in-ground situation a whole, lot. Supertunia Royal Velvet's looking really good, full of bloom, but it's just not quite bushing out quite as quickly. Um, but they're just both being watered by grass sprinklers again um, this year. And I'm, I'm thankful because last year we did Bordeaux and Limoncello. The Bordeaux again did not like being watered too much. Limoncello did okay, but these are doing much better. So I'm really encouraged. You can see on my right hand, everything around the urn is doing great. That's the denim and lace, Russian sage. It's in its prime right now. Now the uh, Superbina dark blue is what I planted around it this year after the Cafe Noir tulips were done. When I planted these, I had to cut them back severely because they were so leggy. I think I'd put it in a vlog. Uh, and so it's taken them a while to kind of fill in and start to bloom again. So they're a little bit, they're not quite as far ahead of the game as my annuals were last year, but I kind of like it. Last year I had Bordeaux. The Bordeaux did excellent in this spot because it didn't get as much water. And then I had uh, White Knight and Snow Princess Alyssum. And it just, it filled in everywhere. I mean, it was coming out in between, from between the boxwoods. While it was very pretty, I kind of like the more tame nature of this. Now, I don't know if it's gonna stay that way. That Superbina might take off, you know, here now that it's getting really warm. Um, that might take off and really fill in. But I think the colors are beautiful, kind of that monochromatic look and the honeybees are everywhere on the Russian sage right now. I love that. Um, right here, this is not planted yet. This is another one I sat to see if I liked it. This is a limelight hydrangea stand on standard. So it's a, a tree form hydrangea. Proven Winners actually has a really nice article on how you can train a hydrangea into a tree form. If it were me, I would just buy it like that because it does take a long time to get it there. If you are the type who likes to see the whole process and like nurture a plant into that form. Excellent. I like to buy them like this and just get them in the ground and have them look like this right from the very beginning. In fact, I bought four of these this year um, down at the garden center. We got in the most gorgeous load of standard trees like this and I couldn't pass them up because they were a really good price. So uh, I'll show you the other ones as we go around the house. Right here in these estate planters, I did Supertunia bubblegum. Superbina Royal Plum Wine, which they're doing really great. I thought the bubblegum would just take over right away, but so far I can still see the Superbina and I think that that's a really sweet combination. I think those two pinks together are really, really pretty. And then right above it, I have a Blue Chiffon Rosa Sharon standard or tree. Look at the blooms on this. This is a really nice one. Look at that, double blue. And it's got buds, both of them have buds all over on them. Um, so I'm really pleased. I did not do a video on this project as well because I have done Rosa Sharon standards in pots before. Um, I don't know if you remember, I did uh, a white one. Is it white chiffon? I don't know. A white Rosa Sharon standard in those pots and I did not have very good luck. And it was because I think I paired things that needed way too much water below it. Anyway, they were not compatible. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna try this out again before I actually do a video and tell you it works. We'll do it this year, see what happens, and then you guys can decide <laughs> based on our results. Uh, the hay racks up here are doing really well. There's Russell. He's hanging out. Hey, buddy. Taking a nap. So the, yeah, these are doing really good. Uh, we've got the yellow tuberous begonia. Um, Boy, I can't even remember all the stuff in here. Uh, Goldilocks Creeping Jenny, we have some L Lavender Infinity P Impatience and then some Potato Vine. Everything's doing really good. I was kind of wondering if the Begonia and the Impatience and Potato Vine would be compatible with one another water-wise, but so far so good, everything's doing great. Okay, let's move around this side of the house. 
a lot more action going on over here. This is one of the beds I need to work on here pretty quick. We've got some yellow columbine that's really pretty, but you can see it's like huge. There's hostas in here. You just can't see them. Um, so it's about time as soon as these are done, I'll come in and shear back the columbine um, and then everything else will kind of fill in and take over. So anyway, lots of that to be done. And then I don't know if you guys saw the video where I planted these hay racks up. In fact, when I was planting these up, Aaron started to freak out. And I was like, what is going on? And we looked up, there's a huge doe in our garden. Oh, there's a deer. Laura, look. Over there. I always tell people we don't deal with deer. No big deal. We don't have deer. Like We're so lucky. I don't know where she came from. Anyway, she's beautiful. We kind of followed her out, Erin. I think got a little bit of camera footage, but we were both in like freaking out because we've never seen a deer this far, like close to town. Okay, so this spot right here, I planted up with the double moon glow osteospermums. Um, there's also some peach berry ice, I think is what they're called, hookahs. Those are gonna come out next year. So I'm just testing them out to see how they do. Um, there's some super blue angelonia, a beautiful uh, pinky winky hydrangea back in there that's blooming. Uh, and then we've got the blushing princess alyssum, which we did a video on, it seems like so long ago that we planted these. Um, over here, they're completely covering and beautiful. The ones over here I actually dug out because I planted them all through this whole area and I thought it received more light and it's because I planted them earlier when the canopies were not so full of leaves. Um, so there was a lot more light and then all of a sudden we got more shade. So I dug them up, put them out here and I just did that like last week and they're already starting to bloom and perk up. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things you have to do every once in a while. On this side of the bed, this is the front side of the bed with all the yellow columbine and it's looking beautiful. I just love this look. Hostas, lamium, there's a boxwood in there. Um, this is a wayfaring tree, it's a viburnum. There's some iris texture in there. I just like all the different shades of green green and blue in here. It's very um, soothing to me. I really like that. I think if Aaron had his way, we'd have like a bunch of flowers, like big color in there. He and I, it's funny, our styles, like Aaron wants, Aaron wants kind of Disneyland-esque. He wants tons of color. And I would be happy with just like all greens and white blooms. So we compromise. This is one of my most favorite areas, of, like views in the garden, minus the car in the background. Um, the host is here with the boxwood and then the, you can see the marooned coleus um, and then this is where our rose garden was which we'll get over there in a minute. Most of the roses are gone now so I'll explain that. Um, but I just love this in the evening, you guys, in the evening, it's so pretty. So the sun sets on that side and right before it sets, you know, like that perfect time when the light's just coming in beautifully, it looks like magical. I just love it. Um, so we move this way. You can see some real pretty color. We did a video where I showed you some of the perennials I planted in this area. Some banana cream da uh, daisies, which I've sheared back already and they're coming back with a second bloom. So those are tucked back in. We've got some uh, Wizard of Oz Veronica, which I sheared back as well. Um, but the nice thing about popping some annuals in is that now that these are sheared back and not full of color, we still have color because of the annuals. Um, and that's why I like to put them in the edges of beds. This is sparkling amethyst superbina. Isn't that pretty? That is such a pretty color to me. You've got two different colors of purple and then the white that makes it look sparkly. And then in this container here that I just popped here, we've got a Supertunia Bordeaux Diamond Frost Euphorbia. This is a wildberry, wildberry hookra and a lemon coral sedum. There's some uh, super pink or pretty much pink, I can't remember. There's an Angelonia in there for some pink color because I have Monarda. This was the perfectly plum Monarda that I've sheared back as well. So I don't know. That's just something to consider when you're doing an area to kind of um, note bloom times of everything so that you can always have some color going. Um, and I knew I was gonna leave some areas for annuals in here to kind of take care of that. Uh, let's see. Oh, this area here. Lemon coral sedum is just so pretty. Look at it up here. It's so bright. 
Then I tucked in a couple of Supertunia Bordeaux, marooned coleus, which I did last year and I loved it so much I had to do more of it here. Plus I kind of pushed some up into that flower bed as well. Um, and then we've got some uh, white echinacea. There's some delphiniums back in there. Now this is the Midnight Masquerade Penstemon. Uh, and I did not cut them back after they bloomed and I'm so glad I didn't. And I don't know what kind of seed things they're gonna form, but they're beautiful. They're just beautiful. Whether or not I leave them here um, or use them in flower arrangements, I mean, I think they'd be a great filler for flower arrangements, but they match the coleus. Like that worked out so perfect. And I'm about ready to come in and shear up my boxwoods for the very first time. So I won't top them. What I'll do is I'll come in and I'll just shear off the sides and it'll kind of encourage them to fill in um, because I do want them to grow higher a little bit. So I'll let them get a little bit more height and fill in a little bit more before I actually top them. Um, so I'll be doing that. These actually get more shade than my other boxwoods, so I can do that now and not be worried about them burning. Okay, so now you've probably noticed that almost all the roses are gone from this area. The reason why we moved the roses is because one, I didn't like all of them. And it's one of my things that I have to like what I'm looking at in the garden. And I know that that is kind of like, for some of you it's hard because it's like a living plant and you don't want to rip something out that's doing well. But you know what, we had some friends over, they dug them out, they took them home and they've got them planted again. So they're in a new spot, we didn't trash them. Um, but just don't look at stuff that you don't like. It's not worth it. Put stuff in that you love. The other reason why I wanted to move them is that this area does not get enough sun um, to make roses happy. This side got a little bit more sun than the other side, um, but they just, they got too lanky and they were always leggy and they were always grabbing you when you walk down the sidewalk. They, the sidewalk's too narrow to have roses on either side that get that big. Um, and with Benjamin, I don't know, you know, we're carrying him in his, um, like car seat and he's got a blanket or one of those things over it and it would snag the blanket and pull it off and it just it wasn't a good situation so you can see that i've got some hydrangeas sitting here it's going to be gorgeous you guys i'm so excited so i've just planted the tiny tots here which is kind of my end piece there's going to be a lavender hedge right here there'll be a lavender hedge going all the way to the end and this is it right here this is called munstead lavender this is um, one of my the ones that i have the most experience with um, I planted Sweet Romance in front of the garden space, which I'm loving because it stays smaller than Munstead. This one gets a little bit bigger, so I didn't have enough room out there for this one. But this will uh, fill in about a two foot section um, on either side of the sidewalk. Um, and I think it'll do okay sun-wise because this area gets more, the edge of this bed gets more sun than the interior part. So we'll see how it goes. But I want to mass plant the entire insides with incredible hydrangeas. Um, these are looking a little bit worse for wear. A couple of them are because they were down at the garden center and in, in, in a windstorm, a huge tree fell right on the top of them. So nobody really wanted to buy them, but it's kind of faith in planting. I know that if I get them in the ground, shear them back um, this next spring, they'll come back and they'll be beautiful. Um, they've got good roots underneath them and they're a tough plant. So I am just looking forward to having a sea of white here and a sea of white on the other side. I want it to be a little bit more balanced and a little bit more formal up here. I think the biggest bloom might be like, look at this, look at these. This poor hydrangea all smashed. I think these are like one of the most gorgeous things ever. I'm just so excited. So I've got five to start off with and then I'll just start adding in as I can get my hands on more. I want to show you the fireplace area real quick. We just recently did a makeover on that. Uh, and I wanted to show you how we store our furniture because there were quite a few comments and questions about it. This right here is what we've decided to do. So in the past, Erin and I have not been very good stewards of our outdoor furniture. We let the rain fall as it may or whatever, and they get ruined pretty fast. So there were a lot of people who were like, okay, so you've got this brand new beautiful furniture in this area. What are you gonna do with it when it rains? Are you just gonna let the cushions stay out or do you come out here every single time? First of all, it doesn't rain very often here, so we're good there. But I did choose dark colored cushions. They're midnight navy and Russell and No like to get on them and sleep. So I didn't really want cat hair on them, you know, wanna keep them nice. So we got these covers. It's super easy just to pop them off when you want to use the furniture. I know it doesn't look like amazing to have the covers on, but if people come over or if Aaron and I want to come out here and use them, we just pop the covers off quick. 
we can use the furniture, then we can put them back on and everything is good to go and safe. So I just wanted to show you what our solution was. And I think we're gonna start buying these covers for the rest of our furniture as well, because we were thinking, you know, how wonderful would it be? These are all weather, so you can leave them out in the winter time as well. Um, and we're gonna leave our furniture right where it sits. And then if we have a snowy night where we wanna come out and enjoy a fire, all we have to do is pop the cover off and we've got nice furniture to sit on that's not wet. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. So let's just go this way. The containers are doing really well out here. I've just recently come through this area and I don't know if you can see, but I did start shearing up these boxwoods. You can really see from my angle down this way. Um, they don't look like super tight yet, but they're starting to train. Um, and that just gives me, uh, I don't know, it just makes me excited. This spot right here, amazing. So autumn frost hostas and dipped in wine coleus doing so well and I was worried there for a little bit because um, something was eating the crap out of my coleus and I didn't know what it was exactly because I couldn't find anything and I came out here when it was dark and I couldn't find slugs and I think it was earwigs um, so I've been out here I spray them with a spinosad and I also bait for slugs and earwigs so I figure you know what one of those things is going to take care of whatever's eating on these plants and it has um, I have noticed some grasshoppers uh, and there's a little bit of damage i think from them but not bad they're really rebounding beautifully and they look so gorgeous there's drip system underneath them so i don't have to even water them i come out here with my fertilizer um, and fertilize them once a week and that's it and then like i have told you guys before this is going to be a walkway because we take our lawn tractor through here um, so we're going to create some sort of walkway here that's why i stopped planting <laughs> kind of looks like an awkward abrupt stop but there is a plan uh, and then I haven't decided when I want to plant here yet. I just came through and cut back all but the, those couple of stems of roses. Aaron was making fun of me. But I just couldn't, I couldn't um, cut these back because when I did this, these were just buds. And I'm like, oh, I got to give them their chance to bloom. So I've got like these random two stems. They look beautiful. I'll cut them back here in a day or two. But this whole area fills in with salvia and I've just cut it all back. The calicarpas, I think that's the name, the uh, coral, not coral berry. Proudberry, Calicarpa, I think, thanks. Um, they're doing great. So this is the one I planted in the video that we did last year and it's got tons of buds. This is gonna have tons of berries and as do the other two. So I planted these two after the video was over, um, just time-wise it worked out that way. And I just wanted this to fill in and be beautiful shrubs with purple berries and I think we're gonna get it. So I'm very excited about that. And then, here is an update on the brick circle area. It's doing really well. So most of it is. We've got three vertigo penicetums, which have grown tremendously since we planted them. We've got the mystic illusion dahlia, which have also grown beautifully. There is um, the vermilionaire kufia. You can see tucked in, kind of in between the dahlias. And that one isn't growing quite as quickly as the dahlias, but they're all very healthy looking. The Bordeaux's, they are blooming their heads off, but their foliage is very yellow. So we've been trying to uh, troubleshoot what's going on. I thought for a minute there that I was giving them maybe too strong a fertilizer, but I don't think that's the deal because all the rest of my supertunias look good and I'm giving them the same ratio. So I think that this area was actually getting too much water, which is kind of strange. And I don't think that this area, it gets quite a bit of sun, but not as much as I thought. Um, enough to keep everything happy and blooming, but maybe if it got more sun, it would dry the area out quicker. So here's what I decided to do. We had drip run. It's actually tapped in over there. It runs underneath the bricks here and it's popped up right here. So what I did is I went and got a valve. You can get these valves that just fit right into your poly tubing. And see, I've got it off right now and then I can come in and turn it on. Um, so now I have the ability to control when this gets water. So it was getting water every day there for a little while. So now when I walk by it every day to, you know, attend to my other things, um, I'll just flip it. Whatever it is, if like it's off today, so tomorrow when I'm watering, I'll turn it on. To, and then the next day I'll turn it off. So it's just every other day. And if I have to back off more than that, so be it. But I mean, I can't complain about the amount of blooms that's going on. They're looking amazing. A um, couple of hanging baskets with some color. Just wanna show you the jellyfish over here. I think I totally did the jellyfish wrong. <laughs> um, I think what they did in the jellyfish, and we'll get the picture and put it up on the screen. Um, I think that they fashioned some sort of upside down 
planter, like upside down, like maybe chicken wire, planted these out the bottom of it and then planted the impatience around like the exterior, like cut holes in the cocoa fiber and planted them in the exterior. I think that that's how it was done. They're still really pretty. And maybe if these like eventually grow, they're kind of just sitting there right now, but maybe if they actually grow to their eight to 10 inch size, we'll start to look a little bit more like that. But either way, it's a learning process and we're learning. <laughs> and I was gonna mention too, you've probably um, seen some pink flags hanging out around the garden um, because we are working on our water system this year. And this is another one of our big projects. Um, like I was telling you before. Uh, so all of our drip system, is a lot of it's hooked into what I can assume were grass sprinklers at one time, which is not ideal. Um, so you can see all of the pink flags, there's three, four of them in this area. They're all indicating where some drip is attached. We're gonna have all those areas dug up and capped and that way we can have like, have these away from the sidewalk and they, they leak everywhere. Um, so when we moved in, we noticed that all of the grass sprinklers were connected to all the flower bed sprinklers. So Whenever we needed to run the grass, the flower beds got it. And sometimes flower beds need more water than grass does. Um, and so it was really incompatible. We were creating a really poor root system on our grass because we were giving it so much water um, while trying to keep our flower beds happy. So Aaron's kind of spearheading getting all, everything separate. So all of our grass zones are gonna be separate from our drip zones in the end. So right now we have 16 zones for that will hit, I think 15 of them are for grass and one of them's for our vegetable garden. Um, in the end, we'll still have the grass zones, but we'll have 28 <laughs> drip zones. It's intense. I don't really understand how like everything works, um, but I know what, what they've done is wherever there's live water coming up, like a faucet or a hydrant like this, they'll tap into that water line and then they um, can run into another box. So there will be two more boxes, like irrigation boxes here. They'll um, separate, they'll create, I guess I should say, create four valves for four drip zones. And it's all run by something called a hunter node, um, which these four valves go into, they're wired into, and you can program them to go off however long you want, how often you want them to go. It's kind of like a um, irrigation box that you have on the side of your house, but it's inside a box down in the ground. And we'll have several of those um, that will just be feeding four drip zones. And so they're battery operated. The only thing we'll have to do probably is come out once a season, like right at the beginning of the season when we're maintaining everything and swap the batteries out. Um, and they should last a full season. Um, that way, because you know, this year actually, we did a video where we uh, fixed some uh, sprinklers that were stubbed up and that was what was watering the whole flower bed. So we capped those off and then I ran drip through the whole area. It was just way too much drip tubing and the pressure wasn't good enough. So it wasn't actually make it to, making it to the end of the drip tubing. And that's a problem. Like we need to be able to run everything by drip because we have too hard a water to do overhead watering. It just ruins our foliage. Um, so anyway, we decided that, you know what, that needs to be a priority. We need to try to get most of our containers on drip, which we've done a really good job, I think, at doing that so far. There's still some I haven't gotten on drip yet. Anyway, um, and maybe at some point I can talk Aaron into doing a video and explaining all of this water issue. Um, I can, I can kind of grasp it, but I'm horrible at conveying that information. So maybe he'll do it one of these days. Um, right up here, I just want to give you an update on these trio containers. They're looking pretty good. Um, it looks like they've got tons of buds. They're kind of like in between. They flushed out beautifully um, and there's tons of buds about ready to open. So the blooms are a little sparser than they were. We've got the vertigo penicetum, which is growing huge. There's lemon coral sedum in that pot, supertunia bordeaux, supertunia bordeaux. There is uh, actually a dahlia in here, which you can see better in this pot, which really wasn't necessary to put in here at all because these other plants just get so big. And there is another lemon coral sedum tucked in on that side right there. We wanted to create three that kind of tied together. Now they just look like one just giant container, which is kind of the, kind of what you want to have happen. Let's look in the vegetable garden. So first off, I actually started planting either side, which is really exciting. So that's where two of the other limelight hydrangea trees went. I thought that that'd be a really pretty thing to do. Now this is a total experiment because this whole area gets full sun all day long. Um, typically hydrangeas in our area can't handle our sun because it's so hot and so unforgiving, but these are a type of hydrangea paniculata that are the type that can take the most amount of sun. So I'm just doing an experiment. We'll see how they do. If they start to look really sad, I'll move them. But everything out here 
in the vegetable garden has done so well and I've been picking so much stuff out of here it's crazy now I'm not going to go through each individual bed um, like I did in the last tour because our tour is probably already pretty long um, but right now we're just about ready to harvest potatoes in fact that's something I'm hoping to do today um, and a couple of new things I've planted are corn I've got corn I just seeded here um, which should mature about the first part of September um, Nothing really new. I, I did put the tomatoes in these obelisks right here. So Gardner, these are from Gardner Supply. Um, they're the SX Round Trellis that came actually in a five foot or seven foot size. I got the seven foot size, but I took one of the rungs out because I thought seven feet would be a little bit too tall, but <laughs> look at that tomato. It's insanity. Now this is a, a sun sugar, indeterminate variety of course, and it's just growing like crazy. So next year I will probably put the extra rung in and have the full seven feet um, because I think this tomato would eventually take that amount of space up. Uh, I do want to show you, it's right in front of me here. I want to swing around and show you how the arborvitas are looking because I'm so proud of them. They look so, so good. Um, so as you guys know, we planted 65 of these last summer. It was 104 degrees out the day we planted them, which was super dumb. That was a dumb thing to do. Um, but they had been sitting in cans since March, and it was like, I can't remember, July when we got them in the ground, or June maybe. I, it was really hot, um, and they suffered a little bit last year. In fact, Aaron kind of um, took that on as his project. He, like, babied these arborvitas last year, make sure they had enough water, um, kept me on, like, the fertilizing, um, and they have just done so well. I mean, some of them had a little bit of brown in them last year from burning, uh, and I think we've replaced three. Three out of 65 is really, really good. Um, usually I, I would expect out of that many to have to replace maybe five or six, um, but we've had super great luck. They're putting on growth, they're widening out, they're looking really nice. So I just thought you would like to see that. Um, we are gonna have to have this tree removed. Um, this is something that just happened. So this is a globe willow, which I was gonna have removed eventually anyway because willows are horrible trees in our area. They get bores really bad. And unless you pound them with chemicals every single year to keep the bores out, you just, they'll eventually fall over in a windstorm, which is what this one is doing. So you can see that the trunk is completely um, leaning and Aaron, I don't know if I can do it, but like Aaron can do this on the tree <laughs> and you can see the roots lifting up underneath the ground. So I have the tree service called. They're gonna come and remove this tree. Um, we have a red point planted way down there. It was one of the group of trees I planted this spring and I tagged three more at the garden center. So we're gonna actually have both globe re willows removed because I know it's gonna eventually happen to this one. And I don't wanna invest time into that tree and money and I don't wanna to have to put chemicals on it um, to keep it nice. So we're just gonna have them both removed. We're gonna plant three more red points along this driveway. And I think it's gonna be really pretty. Okay, a couple more areas I want to show you. First of all, the weeping willow is looking amazing. So maybe the prune job Aaron gave to it last year wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> it looks so glorious. This is how I want them to look. I know it's a pain to like mow under these, but they're just so magical. Like I just love this tree. These are the willows that I will do whatever it takes to keep them nice because I just, I just adore them. Now, right in front of me, there's a golden rain tree that's in its prime, looking beautiful. Uh, the thing I like most about this tree, I, I love the structure of it. Um, the blooms, of course, are beautiful. Look at the trunk. Now, I don't know how old this tree is, um, but it's beautiful. I mean, just the whole structure is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eight looking like eight trunks down there. It's just so beautiful. The um, Velveteen Coleus is doing really good underneath it. Now the Browalia underneath is not doing the best. It did great when it was cooler out. Um, it is a shade loving plant and I put it in a spot that gets after the sun. I didn't know, cause the canopy comes over and I thought, well, for sure it's in shade. And in fact, the Browalia toward the back is doing really well, but this stuff right here gets pounded with afternoon sun and every day it's like it's all kind of shriveled up and I give it extra water twice a day water so I'm going to dig these up I'm going to move all of the ones that are out here further toward the back so they'll enjoy their life um, and then I'll put something else up here that can take the sun <sighs> it's just gardening uh, super tenure royal magenta is looking glorious on the barn in both the containers and in the hay rack so these four are on drip. 
and so are so is the hay rack up there um uh, that one i do have to take a watering can up the stairs in the barn and i open the window and uh, fertilize that once a week uh, these i can hit with the hose down here so this spot right here i've got an exciting project coming up i bought these in fact the tag's still on it these are pyramidal european horn beams you can see right there carpinus betulus fastigiata um, look how skinny and narrow they are. I love the form of them. I am going to create, I'm going to fashion some sort of um, form for them, probably out of PVC, and then I'm going to attach these trees to them and I'm going to train them into an arch. So we have a tree arch back here. I think it's going to be gorgeous. Of course, I already planted annuals in these spots and that's where they kind of need to go. Um, so I would either have to wait uh, to plant them or move these things somewhere else. And I also did put an order in for next year's tree load to have two more of these so I can do the same tree arch on the other opening down on the far end. So we'll have both. Uh, and then I wanted to show you this area here. We've got the rock and deep purple salvia, which is doing so great. Um, then we've got the tangerine slice appeal thumbergia, which just like in the last week or two has really started to take off. It kind of just sat there for a little while. Um, and right now I notice it's filling the ground right below it. In fact, if I was more active about coming out here, and like helping it get started here, it would probably fill this TP a lot faster than letting it do it on its own. But I think in the next probably couple weeks, we'll see a ton more growth up the trellis. But the blooms are beautiful and I think it's a really pretty mix. And then the area right here behind the potting sheds looking still really good. We've got white wands of Veronica which is still holding on. Its blooms are still holding on while the other Veronica's have already faded. This one still looks nice. We've got Hookera and this is a Supertunia Wild Rose, which I think is really pretty. Having the kind of pink tone Hookera with the pink Supertunia there, it's a really pretty mix. Um, the all white containers are doing really well. Back here, we've got the Double Moon Glow Osteospermums again. Superbell's White Diamond Frost Euphorbia. There's a Skyrocket Penicetum. Um, some Silver Bullet Artemisia there. Everything's working well together so far. This is kind of fun. So you guys, we were at Home Depot. We were picking up a couple bags of mulch so that we could match mulch that we were, we were working at somebody else's house. We wanted to match the type of mulch they had. Um, when we were there, this lady walked past me with like nine or 10 flats full of lobelia that looked beautiful. And she said they were getting rid of it and she'd give it all to me for 75 cents. All of them for 75 cents. And I counted how many cells there were, 540 individual lobelia plants for 75 cents. And I thought, you know what? Sometimes lobelia doesn't do the greatest for us in the heat of summer, but for 75 cents, I will take them and I will plant them somewhere. So I kind of just did this sea of blue right here. This little patch is actually in the most amount of sun and it's suffering a little bit but um, I just planted them. So hopefully they all kind of kick it into gear and fill in this area. I think it's really pretty actually, something I would maybe consider doing again, maybe with some other type of annual, but the blue is very pretty, especially when you look through, you can see the hydrangeas and then that dipped in wine coleus back in there. It's just really pretty. Um, okay, one last spot, I think. The fountain's running right there. I just adore that fountain. Uh, that, you guys, is the Kensington three-tier fountain from Henry Studio. Um, they came out and helped us set it up this spring, if you remember that video. And the sound of it is perfect. I can uh, open our bedroom window or even like our kitchen window and I can hear that water all the way from our house. I just love it. I have been working on this spot back here though, when the sun started to come out. Um, so I've just... What was here? Nothing. There was nothing here. Uh, and so I've been kind of trying to fill it in. There's some roses and sedum and a butterfly bush, some baby's breath. Um, this is a really pretty uh, nephopia or red hot poker. I've never really liked red hot pokers because they're usually always red or that really orangish red. But these, I can't remember what they're called, flashpoint maybe? But they're that beautiful yellow. Um, and then we've got some distant drum roses. I put three of them in here and they're really pretty. And then it kind of works into, I've got some pink Angelonia, super pink Angelonia back in there that'll fill in. And then I've got the rest of the bed still yet to plant. It's still pretty empty or full of kind of scrubby looking plants. Um, and then this space here was the pond, which is now nothing um, until we figure out what we want to put there. It just, we put some mulch in there and just decided 
to wait on it and kind of think about it. And there's a lot of other things to work on. <laughs> so we'll just leave it looking like that for now. It's a really pretty view looking this way toward Versailles, I think. Looking and seeing the color of the Russian sage and the really pretty locust trees with the, I think those are sunburst locusts with that really pretty yellow new growth. Uh, but if you look back this way, um, we, I've recently done some pulling out of stuff. So uh, we had some gophers run through this bed as well, and they took out a couple of mycetum. But there's a few maestro sedum left back in there, the Daisy May daisies, which are looking beautiful. Um, there's some fruit, sweetie pie fruit punch, Dianthus, right in here. In fact, there is still some here. I had them planted here. They got so big, so fast. They were climbing out into the grass, and there was grass growing up through them. Um, so I cut them back really short, and I don't know, they'll probably come back. But I popped some Supertunia Royal Magenta uh, in just for the meantime while they're kind of gaining their energy back. Uh, if they don't come back, I'm okay with that because I've got a ton still right here, which I can divide and I can bring some more uh, back up front there. But yeah, I just recently did a little cleaning up in this area. And so everything's just kind of feeling like except for the rose garden, because that one's a little bit more under more construction. I feel like everything's starting to kind of come together, either in uh, theory, like in my mind, I'm starting to think about more spaces and what we can do with them. Like I'd love to bring a bench in right here, because um, there's really not a whole lot of anything back here. And I, we need to have more seating. I think that's really important in any garden space, because you know we could sit right here and we could look out over the view of this lawn and the gardens. Uh, I think that's important to sit and enjoy. Um, some of the fruits of your labor. So that's pretty much it for this garden tour. We saw quite a bit of it. Um, of course, there's little areas that we didn't show you this time because they really haven't changed since our last tour. Um, but we'll be giving you more updates as the season goes. You know, you know, we haven't been doing garden tours on a monthly basis this year just because, um, I don't know, we kept ourselves on that schedule last year of doing a garden tour once a month and it gets a little bit tough to keep yourself like to remember to do it and to make time for it all the time so we figure that we're going to just do one every couple of months as we feel like we've got a lot to show you guys a lot of different things so it's not repetitive um, and that way you can kind of see the process a little bit faster but uh, i don't know how long this garden tour ended up being but you guys seemed pretty receptive to our hour-long one we put up earlier this spring um, so i'm hoping you enjoy just kind of taking a slower walk through the garden and like looking at a little bit more of the individual plants instead of just an overall so anyway thank you guys so much for hanging out today, checking out my garden, and we will see you in the next video. Bye.